Hey, what's up? For today's video, we are going to talk about the part of Swift that can lead to some unexpected and weird behavior. So the story behind this video is that a few days ago, I did a live and along with the chat, well, we tried to go over the Swift quizzes from the website objectivec.io and we discovered in some questions, some behavior of Swift that were really, well, we could say weird and unexpected. And I figured it would be a good idea to do this video and to list what were the top five Swift behavior that surprised me the most. So as you can see, just behind me, there is the code of the first example. So you can see I have two variables, A and B. They are both of type optional int and the first variable holds the value five and the second one, the value nil. And then you can see that I am assigning 10 to both values. But as you can see, it's not really a normal assignment, we could say, because a normal assignment would be like this. It would be just variable equal value. But here we have this extra question mark added. And so the question is, well, after these two statements have been executed, what is the content of both variables? So to get the answer, well, we are going to run this code and we're going to see in the console what gets printed. And as you can see, the variable A holds the value 10, but the variable B still holds the value nil and not 10. And that's the way that this kind of weird expression behaves is that if it were just a regular assignment, well, the value 10 would be assigned regardless the content of the variable. But with this new syntax, it's a bit different. It's what we could call a conditional assignment, meaning that the new value will only be set in the variable if the content of the variable was already non-null. And if the variable is already null, like it is the case here, well, its value is going to stay null, it's not going to be updated. So you can see it kind of like an if let statement, except it's very short and it's specialized for the case of assigning a value in an optional variable. So personally, I had actually never seen this kind of code in Swift, I had never used this syntax, but I understand that if your code relies a lot on optional, well, it could make sense because this is a behavior that you might want to have in your code base. A little word of caution though, if you use this syntax, make sure that all your teammates are familiar with it because otherwise, well, as we have just seen, it can be very confusing and it can lead to your code becoming harder to read. And that being said, we move on to the second potentially weird Swift behavior. So you can see here that I have an enum called my enum. There are two cases in this enum, one and two. And as you can see, the enum conforms to the protocol row reprintable. And to keep things simple here, I have hard coded a row value. And as you can see, this row value is always the same regardless of which case of the enum it is. And then the interesting part is right here, is that I am comparing the two cases together. And the question I wanna ask is, well, what result is this comparison going to yield? Is it going to yield true or false? Well, we could expect it to yield false because actually we are comparing two different cases. However, if we run this code, we are going to see that, well, no, actually it returns true. So it seems very weird because the case one is indeed different from the case two in the sense that there are two separate distinct cases. However, as we can see just here, they both share the same row value because all cases of the enum share the same hardcoded row value. And this is the answer to the problem is the fact that whenever we have an enum that does conform to row reprintable, well, whenever we do a comparison on cases of this enum, what's actually being compared is the row values and not the cases themselves. So even though you might not have this kind of code in your code base because it's kind of weird to have an enum with an hardcoded row value, what's important to remember here is that as soon as your enum implements row printable, well, the comparison is going to compare the row values and not the cases themselves. And it's good to have this in a corner of your mind because it might help you if someday you encounter some weird comparison when you are using an enum. Next, we move on to a behavior that can be surprising whenever you use a dictionary whose value is an optional type. So here, as you can see, I have a dictionary. So my variable is of type dictionary with a key of type string and a value of type optional int. And as you can see, it's initialized with a literal. And so I have the string one associated with the integer one and the string 2 associated with the integer 2. Pretty straightforward. And then as you can see here, I'm trying to change the value associated with the key 2 and I want to set nil to it. So at first glance, what this line seems to do is that it should take the value 2 here and update it to be nil. However, if I run the code, we're going to see that this is not what happens. Actually, what has happened is that now the key 2 has been completely removed from the dictionary and there is only the key 1 and its value that are left. And the reason is, is that 
whenever we use the subscript of a dictionary and we try to set the value nil through it, well, what's happening is that the key and its value are going to be removed. And this behavior doesn't change even in the situation where the value can actually be optional. So it can be a bit weird if you ever have to deal with this kind of dictionary with optional values. However, there is a solution. If you want to set nil for the key two, well, you can do it and you just need to explicitly wrap the nil statement inside an optional. And if you do it this way, then it's going to work. And as you can see now, the key two is still present in the dictionary and it is indeed associated with the value nil. And now we move on to the fourth potentially confusing syntax. So as you can see, I have this code right here. So it's a switch statement, nothing fancy. I am trying to switch over the value five. And as you can see, I have different ranges and I am printing something in the console depending on which range has matched with the value. And what's potentially confusing here is this keyword fall through. You might have never seen this keyword because it's not really used a lot in Swift. But what's confusing when you see this keyword is that you probably are not sure about its meaning. Is it going to have my switch statement keep on trying to match my value with the other cases? Is it going to execute the body of all the subsequent cases? Only the next cases? It's hard to know if you don't already know the answer because it's not really a matter of logic, but rather a matter of specification of what this keyword does. And if we try to run the code, well, we are going to see what the keyword does. So what's happening here is that indeed the value five is matched with the content of the first case. It makes sense. Five is indeed in the range. So the print is executed. And then what fall through does is that it says that the body of the next case statement is also going to be executed. What's important to notice is that there is no longer any pattern matching, meaning that the value can only be matched once and then that's it. So the code is not going to try and match it with the next case. It's just going to execute the body of the next case statement and that's it. And if there had been a fall through after this print line right here, well, it would have kept on doing the same thing with the next print statement, etc., etc. So we don't use fall through a lot in Swift because basically it's more a relic of Objective-C. But if you ever encounter it in a code base, it's important to know how it works. And the way that it works is that it's just going to make the content of the next case statement be executed. That's it, nothing less and nothing more. And now we move on to the last confusing Swift behavior. And I must say this one is the one that surprised me the most. So you can see here, I have a struct called person. So it's a pretty simple struct because there is only one property in it. So it's the name, it's a string. And as you can see, it's declared as a let constant, meaning that it can be initialized in the init of the struct, but it cannot be changed afterward or so it seems. And then here I have this code. So you can see I am instantiating a person whose name is John. I am printing it to the console and then I'm calling this rename method. And you can see rename, it's a mutating function and it's attempting to rename the person to a new name. So it might seem like a weird endeavor because as we have seen, name is a let constant. So we really shouldn't be able to change it. But as surprising as it might seem, there is actually a way to change it. And this way is to reassign self. So you might not know it. And actually I did not know it, but inside a mutating func, you can assign a new value to self. So what I can do is that I can instantiate a new person, give it the new name, and then reassign self to this new person. And so I haven't really changed the content of the name per se because I cannot change it. It's a let constant, but I have changed the content of self and self. I am actually allowed to change it. Why? Because my variable is a var. And so I am allowed to mutate self in a mutating func of a struct. And even though it might seem super weird, if I run this code, is going to work as expected, meaning that we can see that indeed, yeah, the person has seen its name change when we have called the rename function. So it's something that is super weird. Actually, I had never used this possibility of reassigning self. And I'm not really advocating that you should structure your code this way. What I want to point your attention to is that as soon as the method is marked as mutating, well, it has the power to change just any property of the struct, not just vars, but also let constant because it is able to reassign self. And so you need to pay attention to it. And it's not because a property is declared with a let that it is guaranteed that it will never change as long as the variable that stores it is a var and not a let. Well, if you call a mutating func on this variable, 
well, the name can be changed from under you and it might surprise you if you don't know about this possibility. But now you know about it, so hopefully you will be mindful in the future. So that's all for this video about these five surprisingly weird but valid Swift behavior. As I've said in the intro, all these examples, they come from the website objectivec.io. And if you don't know about it, I've put the link in the description and I can only encourage you to go check it out. It's really a great place to learn more about Swift. Now, as always, thank you for watching this video and see you next time.